oh well, my years of research are wasted because I didn't find a statistically significant result with a p-value less than 0.05. But wait, what if I just tweak this here and squint a bit here? Look at that, I just p-hacked my way to a p-value of 0.04 and into successful scientific finding. Time to celebrate. Okay, maybe not, but that's the heart of p-hacking. Making ethically dubious choices in statistical analysis to move p-values, a key metric for scientific success, below the important threshold of 0.05. This video is part of a series of videos on p-hacking, what it is, and why it's so dangerous for science. I give a pretty detailed high-level explanation of p-hacking in the first video in the series, so if you're not familiar with the idea, please have a look there first. I'll put a link to that below. But in a few seconds, researchers are motivated to get what's called a p-value to be below a threshold of 0.05. If they do that, their findings are considered meaningful, and they can typically publish their results. If they don't, well, all their work is largely wasted. And to get those p-values below 0.05, there are some very dubious and unethical approaches that they can take. In this video, we'll dig into one of those unethical approaches that researchers can use to p-hack their data by selectively using covariates in their analysis. Welcome to Data Demystified. I'm Jeff Gallick, and today we'll dig deeper into p-hacking so that you can understand how to spot it when you see research results and avoid it when you do the research yourself. The goal here is to build intuition, so we'll avoid heavy-duty math and statistics and focus on what you really need to know. Now this topic, the use of covariates, is admittedly really tricky to talk about without invoking some more advanced statistical topics, but we're gonna give it a try anyway. We'll do that by imagining a situation where an economist is interested in understanding the relationship between the price of new cars and the fraction of women in the workforce. They're convinced that as more women enter the workforce, the price of cars goes up because with more workers, demand for cars is increasing. So they go collect some historical data on new car prices and women's participation in the workforce. And they run a simple analysis where they predict the price of new cars based on how many women were in the workforce at any given time. They do that and they find that there's a slight positive relationship, just like they predicted, but the key statistical test that would tell the economist if that relationship is meaningful or not comes back with a p-value of 0.08, just above the critical threshold of 0.05 needed to make a strong scientific claim. And by the way, if you're not too familiar with p-values and statistical significance, I do have a video that covers that in detail and I'll make sure to link to that below. Anyway, if that result had come back with just a slightly lower p-value, they would get to publish a paper linking new car prices and women's participation in the workforce. But because that p-value came back as 0.08, all of their efforts are ruined and the economist's ego is crushed since they never like to be wrong. But alas, this economist sits and thinks a bit more only to realize that their analysis was just too simple. Indeed, a lot of things could help explain any fluctuation in new car prices. And so they need to build a better statistical model. They need to account for other things that may have varied during their observation window besides just the percentage of women in the workforce. So they go on a bit of a treasure hunt. They find data on changes in raw material prices, income levels, import tariff, tax rates, and so on. They look up every last thing that they can think of that could possibly influence the price of a new car. And one by one, they put those things into their statistical model. The idea is that by including one of these control variables, or as they're often called, covariates, the model will be able to separately identify any influence that the new control variable has on new car prices from the influence that the share of women in the workforce does. By including these covariates, they hope to isolate the effect of their key prediction from anything else that might be going on. And on the surface, there's nothing wrong with this, and it's often considered a best practice. But in this case, there is something really wrong going on, and let's see why. Let's say our economist first includes the changing raw material prices over time in their statistical model. And when they do that, the strength of the relationship between new car prices and the percentage of women in the workforce really doesn't change too much. The p-value remains around 0.08. So they get rid of that variable, arguing that it doesn't really matter for their model. They then add income levels instead. Now the key p-value actually goes up to 0.10, suggesting a weaker relationship between the two key variables. So they again drop this one for the same reason and move on to variation in import tariffs. And now, all of a sudden, the economists can celebrate because the key p-value just dropped to 0.04, just below the critical cutoff of 0.05, suggesting a statistically significant relationship. 
The Economist is elated and goes on to publish their paper. They argue that their theory about the relationship between new car prices and the percentage of women in the workforce exists and that it's even robust to fluctuations in import tariffs as evident by the inclusion of that information in their model. And to be crystal clear, the p-value of 0.04 is real. It is not made up, nor is any of the data that the economists used faked or manipulated in any way. So what's the problem? The problem is that the choice to include an extra variable in the model was made based on the effect it had on the p-value of the key relationship. As in, it's not the case that the economist in advance made it clear that this model must include import tariffs to be considered valid and then included it. Instead, this economist tried a bunch of different covariates and chose the one that resulted in a conclusion about the relationship between new car prices and the percentage of women in the workforce. That supported their hypothesis. Why not otherwise choose the income level covariate that actually made the key relationship appear weaker? Well, the reason is that they were p-hacking. They were doing what they could to get that p-value below the critical cutoff of 0.05. And in doing so, they are misrepresenting reality. On the surface, it makes sense to include import tariffs in such a model, but it also makes sense to include all the other measures. That the economists chose to just include the ones that helped support their hypothesis is unethical and misrepresents the strength of the relationship between the two key variables. Another way of saying this is that the likelihood that this result is a false positive, a result where the data bears no relationship to reality, is much higher than what the economist is reporting. And that is entirely because they are choosing to include a covariate, not because it makes sense to include it, but because it helps them get below the key cutoff of 0.05. Like with the other examples of p-hacking, this can all be solved by simply pre-specifying a game plan. If the economist just laid out exactly what they plan to do and then stuck to that plan, there would be no issue here. In fact, a growing movement in science calls for what are known as pre-registrations of research, where researchers say what they're going to do and then are held to that plan. They can't just change their minds about how to analyze their data or which covariates to include without raising some serious, huge red flags. By removing the ability to make a choice based on what the p-value happens to be, this type of p-hacking is dramatically mitigated. I hope you now understand a bit better this one form of p-hacking, selective use of covariates. In the other videos in this series, I cover three other forms of p-hacking, as well as a tool that can be used to detect p-hacking in published work. And if there's a form of p-hacking that you want to share with me that I'm not covering, please leave a comment below and I'll make sure to keep the conversation going. Finally, as always, thanks so much for watching.